want to thank you for joining me today for this Tuesday Bible study. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful again for the blessings that you've showered upon us day by day. May your continued strength be with us. May your Holy Spirit guide us as we open up your Holy Scriptures. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so today, today we're going to continue our reading from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 16. And we're going to get right into this, but I want to, but I want to remind you again what the point of the book of 2 Corinthians is all about. It is about Paul trying to argue with the Corinthians that they have, in essence, made salvation about works, about being a good person enough to get to heaven. They've made it all about themselves. The problems with works, what we call works righteousness, is that when it's all about you and what you do, you're never sure whether you've done enough. Paul wants to make sure they know it's all about grace as gifted to us through Jesus Christ. Okay, This is how we get to heaven. It's not something that we do. And he said there's something wrong and warped about this message that we, as the church, as Christians, continue to proclaim. We always want to make it about ourselves and about what we do. And uh, so with that in mind, just set us up for this, for this uh, chapter 6, verse 1. So as, Paul goes on, as we work with him, well, I want to point out who this him is because... Remember, sometimes we read these passages out of their larger context. The him in this case is Jesus. So what does he again convince us of in Jesus chapter 5? Is again, it's all about Jesus. It's all about what he's done for us. And it's not about what you do to get to heaven, but we work with him. We work with him. That's really significant. You don't work for Jesus. You work with him. You are a partner of Jesus Christ. So again, it may not be about you and your works that get you to heaven, but because of what Jesus has done, he's now made you a partner in the working of the kingdom in this world. And I think that is just such a fantastic sign of God's love and trust for you that God would make you a partner with him. So as we work together with him, as we are partners with him, with Jesus and the work of this salvation in the world, so let's go on to this. We urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. <laughs> oh boy. Now it sounds like we're going back to works again. No, we're not. Okay? We're not. There are some people who receive a gift, but then they go and abuse that gift. One way or the other, by neglecting it sometimes. Or say, oh, I've got a gift. Sometimes that's the way it is. We're just talking about this with my daughter this week. You know, it's, it, it, it's uh, you know, I think sometimes it's the wanting of something. My dog was kind of scratching to get something that was underneath one of the tables and she wanted whatever it was and she was just relentless and as soon as she gets it oh okay she walks away from it I said boy she's become this materialistic American my little dog you know we get it and once we get it oh well it's the get it's the wanting it <clears throat> that's more important to us sometimes than the actual having of it and once we get it we just leave it behind and I think this is what Paul is concerned about. Now that you've got it, it's nothing you've done. Don't just leave it behind you. Do something with this gift. Now that God has given you the gift of salvation. All right, verse 2. For he says, and again, the he, Paul is, is doing something clever here. He's conflating the two he's into one because they are one. The he, Jesus, and the he, this is something from God, okay? He's conflating those two because in Paul's mind and in, in our Christian theology, Jesus is not just a nice guy. He is God. So as we work together with Jesus, he, or he says, he says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you. And on a day of salvation, I have helped you. Okay, um, that word save, by the way, salvation, 
And you know, it's so hard to translate this stuff from Greek into English and the different verbs and the different meanings and so forth. And this is one of those verbs that has that continuous impact. It's not a day, it's that day where that impacts the rest of our lives, okay? That day of salvation that continues to grow and, and impact all of our lives and oversees everything. And we don't have an English verb that kind of conveys that type of, uh, that type of uh, meaning for us and so forth. But, but Creek actually has nine different, uh, nine, nine, nine different tenses. It's ridiculous. Uh, we, don't, we don't have that. We can kind of create these different tenses by adding on words and so forth. But this, is, this word is meant to convey for us that this is something that might have been done in the past but continues on into the future and impacts our life every single day. So that acceptable time of salvation, I've listened to you and on the day of salvation, I've helped you. And so remember, the, the premise is don't accept the grace of God in vain, work with God, okay? Work with God. God is here to help us in this time of salvation. Now, salvation can mean a whole lot of things. It, 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 salvation is about restoring broken relationships, okay? This is kind of the primary meaning of salvation. We spiritualize this, but after all, isn't that what salvation is? God wants to restore relationship between us and God. So in our day of need, we call upon God. We continue sometimes to walk in this broken of relationship. This is the whole purpose of salvation, to be this ongoing restoration of these relationships. So this is what Paul wants us to realize, is that we have this ongoing work that happens within this gift of salvation. We don't live it in vain. We continue to grow in it. We continue to restore these relationships. So on the day of salvation, the day of restoring of relationship, it is God that's helped us. And then it goes on. See, now is the acceptable time. Right now. You know, it's that old phrase, seems trite. When was the best time to do whatever it is you should have done? When was the first time to, start to get in shape? <laughs> Probably 20 years ago. Right? You should have kept in shape. You should have kept running or should have kept yourself in good condition. Well, when's the second best time to get in shape? Right now. Today. Okay? If you miss that opportunity, water under the bridge, today's the best time to do it. It's never too late. You're on your deathbed. Today is that last day, the day of days for you. It is not too late. It's never too late because that's the type of God we have. God doesn't say, <laughs> you know what? You lived 85 years of your life as a real jerk. Forget it. No, that's not the God that we serve. God, we might look back and say, man, I just wasted 85 years of my life. Well, let's not waste a minute more. Okay? Don't waste another minute. Today's the day. Today's the acceptable day. Now is the time of salvation. Now is the time to restore broken relationships. I really want you, when you hear the word salvation, to hear this. Restoring of broken relationships. That's what salvation is all about. That's what it means. Verse 3. So we are putting no obstacles in any ways. Okay. Uh, before I go into this section... Um, Paul is going to do something that's really passive. I don't know. Let's do it this way. Aggressive. Paul can do this. He does it. Uh, <laughs> Paul, um, Paul's like that martyr grandmother that you had that just knows how to layer on the guilt but tells you all the while, I'm not going to lay her on the guilt, but you know, or it's your mom, maybe your mom will say that, I'm not here to lay her on guilt. You do what you want. Of course, I'm the one that gave you birth, you know. I'm the one that paid your bills. I'm the one that picked you up after school every day, but you do what you want. This is what Paul's going to do right here. Very passive-aggressive type of argument that he's going to use here. 
So he says, we're putting no obstacles in anyone's way. He's saying, Paul, Paul is trying to make sure he know, that they know that he's not trying to guilt them into improving their relationship with God or moving in. I'm not trying to do it. I'm not, I don't want any fault to be found so that no fault be, be found in our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way. <clears throat> Basically, again, he's saying, we're removing ourselves I'm not trying to guilt you into having a better relationship with God. I'm not going to tell you all the things that I did for you. But, yeah, I'm actually going to do that. So listen to what he does. But as servants of God, we commended ourselves in every way through great endurance and afflictions and hardships and calamities and beatings and imprisonments and rights. Oh, but don't listen to me. You don't have to do what I said, even though I did all this stuff for you. Yeah, that's basically what he's saying. So beatings, imprisonments, riots, sleep, labor, sleepless nights, hunger by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, power of God, the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, and honor and dishonor, and ill repute and good repute. We were treated as imposters, and yet we are true, as unknown, and yet we're well known, as dying, and we see, and we are alive as as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. So don't listen to us, even though we've done all of this for you. Okay, that's what that is. Very passive-aggressive on Paul's part. But let's sum it up. Here it goes on. But we have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians, for our heart is wide open to you. This is sincere. Paul really wants the best for them. Make it about rest restoration of relationships. Don't make it about you, about your actions. That's what Paul's saying is, we're not making about our actions. I'm going to tell you all the actions I've done. But it's not about those things. It's about the fact that Jesus wants to restore relationship with us. Salvation. This is what it is. It's what God has done for us. Let's be participants in this. So he's spoken frankly, our heart is wide open to you. There's no restriction in our affection, only in yours. That's not, that is, that's what Paul says. There's no restriction in my affection for you. You're the one that's got a problem, buddy. <laughs> okay. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your heart also. This again sounds really peculiar, but I would remind you of something really important. Remember the very first book of Corinthians we've mentioned was all about the fact that we had two warring factions, maybe more. The rich, the poor, going at it. The Greeks, the Jews, going at it. The church in Corinth was ready to tear itself apart because everybody wanted to believe that they were the best Christians possible and they were the ones that everybody needed to follow. And this infuriated Paul. He said, you forget about the fact that it's about restoring these relationships and we need to be restored to one another. And so again, he's reiterating this. It's all about salvation. It's about restoration of relationship. And so the one thing that keeps the Corinthians from acting as, as, as faithful participants in the work that God wants to do in this world is simply that they've not opened their hearts to this restoration of relationship. They still are trying to do it on their own. They're still thinking it's about themselves. Open your hearts to one another. Love one another. Restore relationship with one another. Because this is the work of God. So I hope this gives you a little bit better understanding of what's going on here. Paul just has these really, Paul, Paul is really tough to read. Because Paul has, uh, it is really tough to translate some of this into English from Greek. Because Paul has some of uh, the most complex rabbinic arguments. But I hope these things have brought this in perspective. And one of the things... I want you to, to point out to you and, and, and just notice that again, Paul is not just speaking for himself. He uses the word we here. We speak frankly to you. Our heart is wide open. Who is he representing? Well, obviously God. But there are other people with Paul. In fact, 
from the evidence of this letter, this, this letter sounds like Paul, but it's not written like Paul. So chances are Paul has somebody who is writing this on behalf of Paul or co-writing it with him. We don't know who it is. But Paul is imploring them to make salvation, to make their faith about we. It's all about us together. It's not about Jesus and me. It's not about my good works. It's about God working through us to bless this world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks again for Paul's work and for those who are faithful in supporting that work that this message might be known today. It's amazing. Nobody thought that Paul certainly didn't think he was writing the scripture that was going to be passed on for 2,000 years. This is a book to the Corinthians. But yet it's amazing how these words that were so faithfully tended to and passed on to us now can impact our lives too because we act so much like the Corinthians. We make faith so much about ourselves and about what we've done. When it's all about restoration of relationship and it's all about what you are going to do through us. And so God, thank you for making us your partners. Help us to be faithful partners. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And so I'm inviting the Lord's blessing to be upon you this day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen.